www.ccc.com and sermons tab will get you the, the back issues uh, or our app, Polaris Christian Church on the App Store. Go to the listen button and get the audio version of, of where we are up to this point. My title today is 144,000 Possibilities. We're going to get to a place where there's a group of people numbered at 144,000, and we're going to look at some possibilities for that group, but also more than anything, what we continue to see is that uh, Revelation is a book of possibilities. You can research, you can study, uh, but at the end of the day, you just have some possibilities, and you've got to kind of decide, what do I think about that? Um, and that's why I think you've got to balance, okay? 22 years, and this is the first time that I've ever gone through Revelation, because you I don't want to say you can waste a lot of time, but you kind of can. And it's, it's a lot of speculation, a lot of possibilities. Um, and we may never know exactly what the right interpretation is for some of this stuff, okay? So um, I'm going to talk about that group of 144,000 today. I'm going to touch on uh, something in some theological circles that's known as the rapture. Um, so uh, maybe you've heard of the rapture from Grandma or from... Uh, pastor you grew up with, uh, but it's a pretty big uh, theme in, in theology, and so we'll talk about that a little bit as well. So, um, I'm going to keep to my typical format that I've kind of gotten into, uh, where we do about 15 minutes of Bible study, uh, and then 10 minutes or so of uh, practical life application, because uh, I don't think Bible study does a lot of good if you're not actually applying it to your life. Good, but actually taking concepts and putting it to work in your life, that's where the money's at. So, um, that's what we're going to do. Alright, I think that <clears throat> our material today is especially relevant because of what we're going through. Like, this is a pretty difficult season of life. Navigating through. I've said it so many times over the past year and a half. This is just so very hard. Like, I'm not ready to, you know, trade places with someone who lives in Syria, uh, who's far from walked a day in the, uh, walked a day in the lake of shoes, walked in the shoes for a day. How are you going <laughs> Whatever the right way to say that is, what am I going to say? You don't know yet. The life of a Haitian thing. Like, like, we don't know what it's like to walk for a day in the shoes of a Haitian. There you go. Bringing that analogy to completion. Um, but it's so bad here. As we fight with each other over politics or proper COVID response, um, the effects of, you know, trickle down effects of the pandemic and the loss. And this has just been so very hard. And so I think today's message is fairly relevant to the life that we're, that we're enduring right now. So, um, quick review. Last week we talked about those four horses. And how the first horseman is on conquest, and the second um, ends peace in the world, and the third produces inflation, and the fourth produces death by the sword and wild animal. Um, and that's all kind of gotten rolling. And then um, there is uh, the voice of the martyrs that we see, and then there's an earthquake and destruction, and, and then we get to this pause in the action. Now, some people believe that the first six seals and the four horsemen, some people believe that that is kind of ongoing, that that is representative of God's wrath that is poured out um, over our world as a response to evil over the course of the existence of the world. Other people believe that this will happen someday in the future. Like the four horsemen get the nod from God and they ride off into the world in their own symbolic way and it will all happen in the future. Other people believe that most of those first six seals open, including the four horsemen, that was all stuff related to 68 AD and uh, the Roman Jewish War, which ended in 70. Regardless, there's this interesting moment in Revelation.
information stuff, and that's our material for today. So you get carnage and chaos, and then you get this break in the action, and then you get back to carnage and chaos, which we'll see next week. But let me look at Revelation 7, and I'm going to read through it, and then we'll talk about some possibilities. Okay? <laughs> no way to not talk right into this microphone. Not that a cough is a new thing for me. I mean, you know, I coughed with a raspy voice before it was relevant. <coughs> All right. Revelation 7. After this, so, so there's been crazy chaos and harmony and the world is falling apart in the streets. Okay? After this, I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Probably means that the judgment of God had momentarily stopped on the earth. Incidentally, anytime you see the term the earth in Revelation, it can also be translated the land, which could be interpreted as, like, the Holy Land, Israel, okay? Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and the land, and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, or the sea, or the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the seal, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And down in verse 9, after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the land, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I'll give you two quick possible interpretations for this moment. A strange interlude in Revelation. One minute the world's falling apart, and God's wrath is all over the place, and then all of a sudden, heaven seems to be filled with all God's people, and it's one big heavenly worship service, but we're only one third of the way through Revelation. Like, there's chaos, and then there's heaven. And then we're back to chaos for another two-thirds of the book. So, what's going on here? Two possible interpretations. <clears throat> first, for those who believe that most of Revelation took place in the first century, called the preachers, um, they see some things that happened in the first century that seem to fit with this pause in the wrath of God. Okay, so let me walk you through some of what we talked about last week. Rome and Israel, the Jews, are in this skirmish slash war. And Rome finally decides enough. Rome has the power to decide enough. And they start their charge starting up north by the Sea of Galilee, all the way down through into Jerusalem. And there's chaos and carnage every step of the way. So a lot of people believe that that first ride of conquest is the first riot. And then the end of world peace, or the Pax Romana, is the second riot. And then the inflation that was caused by all the war, coupled with the fact that in the scriptures we read last week, the oil and the wine were saved because Rome 
on their charge would not destroy the olive groves or the vineyards, so the oil and the wine were safe. Then there were a lot of people captured and killed by the sword or thrown to wild animals in um, the arenas around. So just like it all unfolds, that's all the stuff that happened in the first century. And then we get to this moment in the war <clears throat> when Nero takes his own life, Emperor Nero took his own life and created a vulnerability in Rome. And this charge stopped. And all the Roman military went back to Rome. Historically verifiable, okay? During that time, when there was a break in the action, it's documented historically that there were many in Jerusalem and Israel who ran off while they had a chance to Pella in Macedonia. Thousands and thousands of Jews especially Jews who knew about Jesus and followed him, escaped during that break in the action. So it fits as these seals are unfolding, and then there's this pause, and there are thousands of Jews who are saved. That fits with what happened in the first century. Why? Let's talk about that. <coughs> okay. This is from Mark 13. There's the words of Jesus 40 years before any of this went down. Okay? Mark 13, starting with verse 14. Jesus said, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, that means that Jesus is saying, When you see pagans, people far from God, Gentile pagans, Romans, when you see them in the Temple Mount, when you see them in places where they shouldn't be. He says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down and run of the house to take anything out. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in the winter. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. After the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Start to fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of, the man, the son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send out his angels and gather from his elect is elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth, and to the ends of heaven. Now, this was all common apocalyptic kind of language back then. Coming with the clouds, we talked about this a few weeks ago, meant God's judgment. 29. When you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away all these things take place. There were multiple times in Scripture when Jesus painted the picture of these kinds of calamities, and he says, this generation, or he says, some of you, he's talking to real people in the first century, some of you will not taste death until all these things take place. This generation is looking at real people. You guys, he's saying, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So, so something happened in the first century. And Jesus tells his people, when you see these signs, get out. Don't look back. Don't go back. When you can, get out. And there was a group of people in the first century. When Nero had died and there was a break in the war, they got out. And there's speculation, and I think it's very reasonable, that in Revelation, when it talks about a pause in judgment, and then a group of, of Jewish followers of Jesus sit, being saved from what's going on, it very may well be that moment in time. 
Now, could be any, any number of things in the past or the future, but here's another possibility that is often talked about, something called the rapture. Okay? Some of you maybe had a grandma or a pastor growing up that told you about the rapture, this idea, rapture meaning like glorious happening. Okay? This idea that either before or in the middle of this huge tribulation, suddenly all the believers, all the followers of Jesus, are teleported into heaven. All right? Remember the Left Behind series. This was a book series about them. Planes crashing because suddenly the pilots fall. Stuff like that. And then people who are far from God are left behind to try to figure everything out. Okay? Now, some of that thinking is taken from Revelation 7 when the elder says, these are the ones who were taken from the great tribulation. Now, let me talk for a minute about the rapture because it is a big blob of theology that's out there. Um, first of all, if your grandma taught you that and you need to believe granny and it works for you, go for it. If your pastor who was awesome taught you that and you need to believe that, or if that's helpful for you, there is nothing wrong with believing that we're just going to disappear before really bad things happen here and be saved from really bad things. And if that works for you, go for it. Unfortunately, I don't have the kind of personality that lets me completely stop there, though. So let me have a moment to talk through my thoughts about rapture. Um, first of all, I absolutely believe that one day Jesus will return, and the dead will be raised and judged, and that there will be a transition into the renewal of all things. That is clear in Scripture, that is concise, that is findable in the Bible in those terms, in certain terms. However, the idea that the church is sucked out before or in the middle of really bad times. That is a lot of speculation on a very little amount of scripture. Like it's maybe, you know, 10%. This scripture may say this if you look at it just right. And then 90% speculation. Um, but here's the big thing for me. Not only is like the rapture, the word rapture, not in the Bible, and the concepts, it's tough to look at the Bible and say emphatically um, rapture theology. But here's, here's what's more important. In the ancient world, Christians from the first century on, some of whom were mentored by the disciples themselves, they wrote books and books and books and books speculations and thoughts and, and, and great works of theology. And in all those ancient works, endless, there's just no mention of any kind of thinking like the church is sucked out of the world while tribulation and bad things happen. Or that non-believers are left behind while the church is taken. There's just, and these were people who were going through immense suffering themselves. And, and it, is, it is a very modern thing. There is, there's just nothing in ancient Christianity that, that fits with rapture theology. Um, and then also, I, I just I feel like John would have written in Revelation different. Like, it would have been more like, hey, some stuff's going to happen, but you're not going to be around for it. Like, don't worry about it. There's all this stuff, but don't worry about it. You're not going to be here. But that's not, there are points in Revelation that we'll see in the coming weeks where John's like, hey, 
Anybody have wisdom? You'll be able to figure this out. Like, like, I think that it's a fairly... I was talking to a friend between services. It's just kind of an immature view that we would expect to get out of tribulation. Um, that's not fair. I don't want to... It's not fair to call the rapture an amateur. Um, even though I just did. It's not fair. Um, because it works for a lot of people. But the idea that God removes us from bad things is tough to find in the Bible. Alright, so let's move on to some... Let's move on to some real life application. And I really do mean that. The rapture works for you. Um, go for it. And we're in heaven someday. We just got sucked out. And you were right. All on up. <laughs> okay? Get to my face. I will happily say, man, I was wrong about that. Jesus be like, yeah, you should have been listening to him. <laughs> All right. Marcus is like, yeah, I never did anyway. Oh! <laughs> like application. I love the way Revelation moves in and out of talking about the really bad stuff and then returning to a picture of heaven. Talking about the really bad stuff and then returning to a picture of heaven. Revelation stays tethered to the throne of God. 18 out of 22 chapters in Revelation mention the throne room of God. 47 times in Revelation there's imagery of the throne of God, of the merciful throne of God that is bringing all things to renewal, that is bringing forth and leading toward worship, Jesus being in the midst of his people, like Revelation tethers life in all its seasons to the throne room of God. So here's my point of application. Create something in your life that tethers you to the throne room of God. So that throughout each day, for fractions of moments, you are reconnecting to that throne room imagery. Good days, bad days. Now I'm going to tell you what works for me. Okay, this is what works for me. There's a million different approaches. This one, this works for me. There's something that the ancients called praying the hours. Not praying four hours, praying the hours. Which was their way of saying kind of like, um, uh, think of, you know, in terms of an alarm clock, or there were certain times throughout the day, praying the times, so that a few times a day, they would stop and work their way uh, through a, a prayer or reading ritual. Now, there's a lot out there. I use this called the Divine Hours. Okay, I got my book up there, my picture up there. And, and each day, those Sunday through Saturday, and it is broken down into a handful of prayer hours, and it even tells you, like, um, here's the, uh, the Vespers office to be observed between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m., okay? Now, each prayer hour has a few readings. A lot of times it's just a sentence from somewhere in the Bible, sometimes it's a little chunk from the Gospels. One of the great passages of scripture. Maybe there's a hymn, a couple of psalms. But for me, one of the most important things <coughs> is the Gloria and the Lord's Prayer. Now, those are memorized. You've got to look them up. It's glory to God in the highest. It's peace to men of good will. We praise you. We bless you. We adore you. We glorify you. And we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, God, Father Almighty, Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son. God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayers. You sit at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. 
For you are holy, because you are the Lord, you alone, Lord Jesus Christ, our Most High, together with the Holy Spirit, the glory of God the Father. It takes a while to memorize it, but you say that in light of this great affirmation of the truth of God. You can say, we give you thanks for your great glory. Like, there's something, like, empowering to say that a few times a day. And then to roll right over into our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. We forgive those who sin against us, lead us down to temptation, and deliver us from the evil one. But to have that back to back, when you have that memorized, now, a couple times a day I'll go to the book, and I'll do the scriptures with it. The whole thing takes about three minutes. Three minutes, three, four times a day, sometimes not even that. But then I'll find myself at times driving, or as I'm contemplating bad news, or I'm out for a flight drive, I just, just pause and go through the Gloria and the Lord's Prayer. And that has become for me a system to tether my life to the throne. So that good day, bad day, boring day, eventful day, can almost do anything and be doing anything, and you're returning regularly to the centrality of the throne. And so that's my, my first point of it. And if you guys want to check out the book, I'll leave it up here and I can message you, email you, whatever, um, how to get it. But uh, I, I usually use my Kindle version on my phone, but I also have like, the hard copy too. Um, application number one, no matter how far you are along in your walk with God, far along, not very far along, find a system. And the other thing with this is it's not like hyper-spiritual. It's not like I you know, finished working through that and feel spiritually invigorated. I mean, sometimes, but a lot of times it's, 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 it's fairly just kind of repetitive and mundane. Um, but it's something to continue to return to. So that, I mean, the best way that, that I say this, I guess I said it last week, um, if you're doing this every couple times a day, then you're not having a day where you haven't thought about God. If you haven't had a day where you haven't thought about God, then you haven't had a week where you haven't thought about God. If you haven't had a week, then you haven't had a season where God is in your life. So it's little things like this that you build into your day that produce lasting results over time. All right, second point of application. I think we need to come to see the trials in our life not as something to be avoided, but as a kind of spiritual steroids. The ancient Christians viewed their difficulties not as something to get away from, but rather as something to embrace and welcome into their life because they, those trials, had the power to produce incredible spiritual results in their own world. So I'm going to read to you from um, 1 Peter. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer, have had to suffer uh, grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that proven genuineness, first service, I realized it's time for me to make my font bigger on mm -hmm. my own notes because I looked at like nine vowels all together and my brain wouldn't do it. The genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And I feel with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are received, you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Couple little phrases in there where you say, God, you know, though you do not see him, you believe. And when it comes to trials and temptations, you notice that for though we're fine by fire, 
the idea of being strengthened through stress. Not only are we strengthened through stress, but we can't, we can't see God and yet are able to express our love and faith in Him through difficulties. And this is the only age where we'll have that opportunity. You ever think about that? This is the age of faith and there will never be another one like it. And one day we will see God face to face and there's an end to suffering and pain and sorrow. But we'll see him face to face. Now is the only opportunity we have to give this gift to God. This gift of not being able to see him and yet choosing to trust him and love him and express our faith in him will never have this opportunity again to go through pain and choose to believe in an unseen God. And what a gift that must be to him. Because he's God, and there's not much you're going to give him. But the one thing we can is for a relatively short, short moment in our eternal existence is this time of an unseen relationship. We can trust him, we can love him, we can express our faith to him going through difficulties. So rather than stress about trials or hope to avoid them, what if we try to embrace them and realize this is our opportunity and we'll never have again to show our love for God even though we can't see Him. And also, if you have friends or family that are far from God, there's nothing you're going to say that compares to the peace and confidence you have going through difficult seasons of life. That's what shows the realness of God to people. So, that's my second thing of application, is rather than stress about trials, difficulties, see them as opportunities for growth and love toward God that we will never have again. All right, we're going to do one last song.